Can you guys hear me? That's always the first question. Get out of town. Kate Stillman is in the house. Stop the presses. Hi, lady. Bow down. How fucking exciting. We have been cussing. Just want to prepare you. Kate, I don't know as you swear so much. Anyway, let me just quickly introduce. First of all, what we're doing. Y'all are here for a VIP session. Are you feeling your DC? I brought my sequins to go with Kate's dress. <laughs> Kate's like, she doesn't need sequins. She's way past sequins. She's in, I don't know what dimension. She's so evolved. We'll just see if personal story might be a portal, might be a spaceship, might be a vehicle that we could somehow marry with Ayurveda. Is Ayurveda for authors? Before I, I'm just tossing those out to maybe plant some seeds in the galactic mind and spirit and body that is Kate Stillman. And I wanna welcome all you guys back. Check you guys out, cause we had a gnarly day. We had a beautiful day, but we had a, I would say it was a pretty packed day. Could you, I'm gonna ask you guys just to help give Kate a minute. And I know she doesn't have much time, <clears throat> just to give a one line sum up, ooh, if you can, about what happened today, just to give her, if anyone has, wants to raise your hand. Oh, actually, we don't have to do that. You guys can all, right? Unmute, unmute y'all sales. Claim your sovereignty, claim your creative authority. Anybody want to say, oh, okay. Beth is saying an exhausting and emotional day. Sheila yeah. is saying moving and grateful. So we were from eight in the morning or 7.45 in the morning until 45 minutes ago. Wow. Nonstop and digging deep, digging deep in the personal story. So mm -hmm. we have Kate here only until 5.30 at my time. So 28 minutes. So I don't want to waste. I mean, this is fracking incredible. Thank you so much. Biggest hug, man. This is a big deal. Glad You're to be amazing. Here. You're amazing. So I'm just, I'm going to tear up because we had that kind of day, but also you just make me feel that way, even though you're so razor logical as well. <laughs> and I mean, she's, she has, she's one of those people, I know I'm going to do a proper uh, intro and she's one of those people, Kate, who has both all sides of the brain working. I've had to work my ass off to get the logic side, the planning side, the strategic side. I got that fishy Piscean, I don't know what was going on, but I've had a really, and Kate, it seems like you've always had that, but let me just see if uh, I want to see what specifically, because let's do this, let's do this formal because it's so pithy. Of course, she comes up with this incredible bio that's pithy. So Kate Stillman has guided a global online tribe to thrive in their bodies while achieving their life goals through innovative yoga and Ayurvedic teachings since 2001, people. This is not, oh, I just decided to do this today, which is fine if y'all are doing that. I'm just saying, wow. She hosts the Yoga Healer podcast and is the author of two books, count them, Body Thrive and Master of You amazing stuff. Kate splits her time between Alta, Wyoming and Punta Mita, Mexico. For free training, check out yogahealer.com, listen to her podcast. I'm going to make sure you all have access to that. And now we kind of know each other. So I think we can be fluid and fly with this just for the heck of it. Cause Kate's probably like, I don't even know what, what am I even at? I just said, yes. I was, you know, what, what is this thing? All right, just to put you out of your misery. So it's a it's a live event. I'm teasing. Raw and real is the title. So we can let that kind of percolate and simmer. Raw and real live, the skill and art of personal storytelling on page and stage. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's happening right now. And I was talking about how taking your Ayurvedic detox, which I meant to do for many, many years. And it was the pandemic that tipped me hmm. because I felt, uh, I read Charles Eisenstein's coronation. Cause I was kind of hmm. going down a 
rough path where I was buying into a story that didn't suit me, heart palpitations, fear, things. I've worked very hard to say no to that storyline. Mm -hmm. And I felt it was in conjunction with Eisenstein's essay, it was for me a call to claim greater sovereignty over my health, my body, all that. And I was like, it's time. And I did Kate's detox and I haven't had any caffeine of any sort since then. And I was a fanatic, started with four shots plus green tea first thing in the morning. That was just the starter. And uh, I just had my kitchery and I'm drinking my hot water and it, it's just changed everything because digestion seems incredibly important for our health, but also for narrative. Cause these guys did a lot today. Yeah. And I thought it might be interesting to talk about that. Cause there's anyway, what, you know what? I just kind of wanted to give you enough that what interests you, what do you feel like talking to? Cause you're so brilliant. Mm. What intrigues you about this? Does per, is personal yeah, stories? Yeah, I mean, it was interesting even like filling out the questions uh, to get in here, you know, and, and 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 about storytelling. I think I the last uh, sort of impromptu story I told was at I was at a funeral a few on Monday. My aunt died, and I was listening to the speaker speak at the funeral, and then at a certain point, uh, they said, you know, does anyone else have something to say? And I, I wasn't planning on, I wasn't planning on speaking, uh, but I, I realized that some things, some things needed to be said. And so I, and so I popped up and, and grabbed the mic. Uh, one of the things that I found, I mean, I've, I've hosted over 500 podcasts, so I'm, I'm quite comfortable with the microphone. Uh, and in the questions and getting in here around, around telling stories, uh, and it's really story that lands. I think that's why you guys are all here. It's a story that engages us as human beings, right? We, we were, I actually love the work of Jordan Peterson who really draws from the process of how our, it, it seems to be our brains and nervous systems evolved on story. That it's very tied into the, the, the structures of our psychology, um, including the, the structures of our nervous system. So there seems to be inherent in, in human beings a, a very, very deep, very deep need for story. So in the questions and coming in here, one of the, you know, it's like, what is the hardest thing for, for me about story historically was around humility. Uh, so I've led, a, I've led a global tribe for a long time. I, and, I, and I know some people aren't comfortable with the word tribe, you can substitute community. Uh, it's, it's around a value structure, right? We, we believe at, at Yoga Healer, we believe that, that health is your birthright. And we believe that there's a lot, of, there's a lot more free solutions to, to thriving in your body and, and in your lives than you might have, have been to, led, to believe in a consumer culture. There was a breaking point for me and it was, it was, I was well into, I was well into my career. I'd been leading yoga healer already for maybe, I don't know, over a decade. I'd been making, I was making great as Rachel will attest, I was making great money. We met in a women's, uh, in a women's business development program. Uh, and so I was, I was able to get pretty far without humility in my storytelling. But at some point, I realized that there, it was creating a barrier between authenticity and deeper connection and intimacy. Uh, and, then I, and then I was misrepresenting an experience because I wasn't being humble. Like I really wasn't, and I wasn't being honest. So I started, I started to be able to speak much more from, a, from a, a place of like, I don't know it all. This is what's working for me right now. And that started to really make really make the difference. And the way I'm going to tie this into what happened on Monday when I, when I popped up and grabbed the mic to tell some stories about my, my dear aunt, the kid's sister to my dad, I grabbed the microphone and my voice was shaking. I cried through, I, and Rachel will attest, like I'm tough as nails. I'm a very masculine female. Uh, I'm a very competitive athlete. I've been so all my life. I've I've played sports with boys most of my life. I've continued to mostly do sports with men. Like I'm, I'm a very masculine kind of gal, uh, but I'm also able to release into the moment. And a lot of that is thanks to, to my yogic training. 
So I'm sitting at the, at the service and it's, you know, we're a good, you know, 90 minutes in and I've just had tears streaming down my face the whole time. I'm holding her grandchildren, uh, one of them on my lap. The other two are sitting next to me. They've lost their grandmother. And, you know, by the time I grabbed the mic, like everyone's been sitting in their seats. I'm the, I was the last person to speak. And I, you know, I grabbed the mic and like, wow, I cannot hold a steady voice. And I'm used to being able to, to be very, very steady in my voice, very eloquent in my delivery. And my voice is shaking and my, my eyes are, are streaming, but I had stories that need to be told. I had stories that needed to be heard for there to be a sense of closure um, to the whole experience. And that's something that I never would have, I never would have been able to do at some point in my storytelling. I never would have allowed myself to go up and not really know what I was gonna say, even though I knew something needed to be said. I never would have gone to the mic uh, from the place of emotional you know, train wreck that I was in um, at a certain point in my storytelling. So I, I guess my point being this, there's often a sense of the story that needs to be told. And when we tell it authentically, something lands. And so what happened after was, it was so fascinating to me. Like so many people came up and thanked me. Like for the, it was really for like the next two days because we were all among family and friends for the next few days. And, and so many people just thanked me for this impromptu story. And, the, and, the, and when I came to it, it was like, the reason was because I was able to be in the emotional state that they were in. And it connected and landed. And it was, it was like that which blocked me in the past from reaching people when I was able to, to speak from that space. Come what may is what really enabled people to, to feel and to connect and to be in their process of mourning. So I, that's, that's really my core takeaway is like for me, humility and humbleness was, it was a massive, it was a massive barrier to me at one point and and now it's not um and so if that's for you just just know that like yeah that's that's part to in my experience it's it's part of sort of like the the evolution of of your storytelling that is absolutely fascinating and please let me offer my condolences about oh, that. thank you. Yeah. I, I'm so sorry. Yeah. And, it's life though, right? I mean, and that's really, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's life and death, death and life. Well, that's something we spoke about recently too. Yeah. Uh, that you were doing some investigation into that realm in terms of. Say more. Well, you, you suggested a book to me that was specifically about oh the journey of souls exactly yeah yeah you know and also I'll, I'll speak a bit to i'll speak a bit i'll tell another story about death and rebirth so her grandchildren live in a in a much more sort of suburban urban environment without much access to the wild and in my work as a healer one of the one of the core aspects that my work has taken is, is into rewilding human beings. It's like kind of the opposite of uh, like antibacterial alcohol, like rubbing alcohol on your skin. <laughs> it's, it's like the opposite of that. It's like the opposite, it's the opposite of a sterile environment. It's a vibrant, alive environment. It's that you can't be separate from your ecosystem and your ecosystem can't be separate from you. And if that is, you are in a diseased state. So this rewilding has, uh, it's been a part of my work for a number of a number of years. Like one of the one of the core components of of my work at Yoga Healer in the last decade is to help reintegrate humans with with invasive weeds. Invasive weeds are, the, are there's 13 wild weeds that seem to appear on every continent, including Antarctica, which is a little crazy pants. Uh, but these weeds are nutritive. These weeds are nutrient dense, and these these weeds are are the permaculture plants, which are replenishing the topsoil, which is no longer hospitable to native plants. 
But there's many ways that rewilding, there's many ways that rewilding takes place. This whole next uh, series of, of work that I'm putting into the world is around Shivambu, which means urine therapy. A lot of people don't know about it, but basically your urine is a, your pee, your pee is a cure-all if you upcycle it back into your physiology. It's very controversial, it's very misunderstood, um, but I'm, I'm making a, uh, a cartoon book on it next so that a five-year-old can read it and really understand and, and, and start to ask their, quest, their parents better questions. Someone that's in their 50s can read it and start to practice it right away and see the benefits on their sleep because most 50-year-olds today can't sleep through the night. So there's a lot of benefits and I, I mean, it, it, the history is there, et cetera. Um, in any case, rewilding to me, it, it goes far and wide. And these, these three grandchildren that are gonna are sorely missing their grandma and it hasn't even begun yet, right? It's like, it hasn't even begun. Uh, they're, they're gonna miss her for particularly the next few years of their lives, the next decade of their life. And these kids are not rewilded at all at all. They're highly conventional. Their thought, their thinking structures are highly conventional. Their belief system is highly conventional, which means influenced by a culture that really understands allopathy, that really understands the world of matter and reductionism, but doesn't really understand the world of, of holism and universal laws and, and the you know, holistic sciences, including a lot of the wisdom traditions from, from the East, a lot of the wisdom traditions from indigenous cultures globally. So we had uh, a moment in, and I wasn't even planning on going to the funeral. We had just been with my aunt. Everyone had been all together about six weeks ago and we had all decided like, we're not gonna do the funeral. We're gonna be with her before she dies. And then it happened. She died that night. I'm standing on my patio and the light, I live in the Tetons. The lights was phenomenal. Uh, the sun was setting. It had just rained and a double rainbow broke out in the sky and I, and I texted my two cousins, her daughters. And I said, you know, there's, and I just, and I just said this, I just want you to see this. Like I, I'm getting a strong hit of your mom. And uh, the next morning I woke up and I'm like, you know, I gotta go. So, so I packed my bags and I don't know if any of you have ever packed in a rush. And if you're quite intuitive, like some things will end up in your bag and you don't have time to second guess them, right? So I threw in my Hags and Witches tarot deck, which was mailed to me randomly by the author, uh, by the authors of that, these witches, these witch women. They're, it's amazing. It's an amazing deck. I threw that in and I threw in a bag of, uh, of service berries, of dried service berries, which is a, it's an, it's a, it's a berry that grows all across the United States. It's really high in antioxidants. The last story, when I was sitting with my aunt, the last story, my, my aunt, uh, reflected back to me. She was asking about this land I had bought. And I said, oh, it's full of these berries that are, that are really deeply nutritive. And she said, is it service berries? And I was like, how do you know about service berries, Aunt Susan? Because she also was not a rewilded person at all, very allopathic and in her perspective. She went through like the Western stage four drug treatment, uh, which is really intense, the chemo, the radiation, the surgeries, the, all that in the past year of her life, it was really traumatic. And she said, well, before all that, we were on a hike and you showed me the service berries and we started harvesting them. And I had totally forgotten about that. So on my way out the door on Saturday morning, I threw a bag of dried service berries, just, think, just not even thinking, just like threw them in the bag. And so anyways, fast forward to, it was after the, it was after the funeral, uh, it was the day after and, and two of her grandchildren are 15 year old twins they're fraternal twins and they're like night and day. They don't even look like they're from the same family. And they are not rewilded. They're very, very, very conventional in their thinking and in their belief. And, and I knew they'd never done anything like a tarot reading. I knew they'd never tasted wild food like a service berry. And I said, do you guys wanna do a, do you guys wanna do a reading? And they love me. They think I'm kind of crazy. I swear, I do swear a lot. I'm very unconventional, but I'm also in incredibly connected, you know? So I can be very deeply present with people and they need that and they want that and they're attracted to it. So I'm like, yeah, sure. So we, we went and found a quiet spot outside in the shade. And I had them playing with the tarot deck, playing with the cards. And I asked them to each think of a question, like what was the, the, 
the, the deepest question that was really reoccurring for them in this, in this phase that they're in, the cycle that they're in. And in this, you have to, you know, in this process, you have to know nothing. Like you have, like as the reader, you have to be open as a blank slate. You can't have any preconceptions and really uh, to some degree, no premonitions. It's like, it's really just a very, very, it's an experience of deep presence, very similar to, to deep meditation where you're just, in, you're just in the moment of it from a place of profundity. And this deck is very hard to read, actually. It's quite, uh, the Hags and Witches deck is, is quite, com it's, it's, <laughs> it's really good. It's very magical and mystical and medicinal. Uh, but if you're not at that level, you'll miss it. So the first one, who's the shyest girl I've ever met? She asks the question, how do I get a boyfriend? <laughs> and again, like you can't let your jaw drop, right? Because But it was the sweetest most earnest and she's got her braces on and she's the shyest girl I know. She's a great athlete. She dresses like a boy. She's uh, incredibly bright, introverted, logical. And so we just sat with that. We just sat with that for a moment. And I asked her, what do you value? Because just to have a boyfriend isn't enough because you can have a value that that really doesn't resonate. And then you can have an experience that you don't really want to have. So, so what do you value? And she said, intelligence, kindness, ability to learn. I mean, it's coming out of a 15 year old who's never done a reading, like is not used to having these kinds of conversations. And so then she uh, pulled a card and her card was rhythm. And it was about a cycle ending and a, and a cycle beginning. And I asked her, I'm like, when, when are your braces coming off? And she said, Friday, <laughs> it was Monday. <laughs> and I said, what else is going on? And she said, I might not make the sports teams. She's going to a high school that has thousands of kids. Like thousands, I, I, it's one of these huge high schools. I wanna say like 12,000 kids. Like it's not even one of the mega schools of 4,000 kids, yeah. So the ability, and she's tiny, lightweight. There's no chance she's gonna make these sports teams just based on, she doesn't have the size. She doesn't have the genetics for it. And so I read, the, I read it and, and we looked at how this, this cycle of, of playing with all girls is coming to an end and how in her, her, her school has intramural sports, co-ed intramural sports. And, She's getting her braces off and how she can start to design her future to the one she wants to create for herself and how she can change and grow into the person that she wants to be. She doesn't have to be who she's been. And that to, to be who she wants to be in a relationship with her boyfriend that, that she might need to empower herself and how, how she looks and how she wants to act and what kind, and, and where these, where she might, really enjoy being with her boyfriend, which would be playing sports. And she left the conversation with the sense of the world can be what she wants to create it, how she wants to create it. And then I asked her twin sister, who's the dark and mystical one, to look into her sister's eyes and to see how dilated her eyes are. And eyes get dilated when you're learning. Eyes get dilated when you're stretched beyond your past experiences, between, beyond what you've already known. And so then we turn to her sister who was shuffling the deck and, and I asked her sister, What's your, what is your question? And she said, well, I have trouble making friends, like good friends, like the kind of friends that you really wanna be friends with. And so I asked her, well, what kind of, what, what's going on? Like, what kind of friends have you had and what, what's going on with your friendships? And she said, well, I tend to be friends with people that betray me. And so we sat with that for a minute, because that hurts. And when there's feeling, and this is a huge, I'm sure you're talking about the power of the pause. 
I do a lot of coaching and the coaching that happens at yogahealer.com is, is very intimate and it's intense and it's happening in front of a lot of people, right? Because I don't do one-on-one, I don't do one-on-one coaching. And there's a power of witnessing when someone else is in an experience of digesting an emotion. So those of you who don't know Ayurveda, Ayu means life and Veda is the study of. And the study of life comes with the co-evolution of yoga. So it's how, how are you able to be and thrive in your body and in your life so that you can pursue enlightenment, which is the practice of yoga. It's, it's very misunderstood right now, but essentially that's what it is historically. So Ayurveda is this, is this body wisdom tradition, but it's also a mind wisdom tradition and a spirit wisdom tradition. And there's a core concept in Ayurveda, which is emotions need to be digested, just like your food needs to be digested. And if you're not digesting what you're taking in and you keep taking in, in a rhythm that you're not pausing to digest before you take more in, what happens is disease. And so when someone is in an experience of telling a story or in the experience of, in this case, a tarot reading and a, and a very deep, powerful emotion comes up, an emotion of betrayal, you don't gloss over it, you take a moment and you feel it with the person and I think that's a lot of what happens with stories is that we're taking someone on a journey with us and in the process, they can digest things that, that maybe they've also experienced and maybe they haven't had time to really process it. And what happens again, when, when that which is on process lives within us, it becomes disease. It overloads the system so that we're not open to new experiences. We're not open to that which is possible because we're, we're actually living a repeat of the past. So when Rachel's story was betrayal and at the core of it, she wasn't, she was betraying herself, right? Isn't that always what it is? And she was betraying herself because she didn't know her power she didn't know the power of her voice. She didn't know the power of her posture. She didn't know the power of her person. And so she picks a card from the deck and the card is, it's so cool. It's the, it's the grove of ferns. You guys know what a fern is? It's, it's, that, it's a very, very green plant. It has a central stalk and it has a lot of leaves and it creates a lot of fullness, a lot of greenery, a lot of chlorophyll, chlorophyll, supplies our blood with oxygen. Chlorophyll absorbs our carbon, right? So that's what the, this plant is, the embodiment of that, and it grows in force. And when you walk into one, you feel the life force energy or what in yoga we call prana. You feel that, and you can breathe. You can breathe and be yourself in a place that you can breathe. And it loves moist environments. It loves nourishing groves and it grows under the protection of trees. That's ferns. So she picks the, the, the grove of ferns and the word is, is this hologram, meaning that the one fern is whole unto itself, but it exists in a community of ferns. And that's the card that she picked for betrayal of herself, betrayal of friends. And so in the experience of talking with her, you could see this process of allowing it to sink in. And it's not like these 15 year old girls who live a very commonly acculturated suburban life. Oh, you wanna to come too? All right. This is Duke. Hi Duke. He sometimes likes to join us and say hi. She had the very first dose of an invitation into her own authenticity, into the power of turning betrayal into self-empowerment. 
And when you're in an experience like that, there needs to be a space held. There needs to be a sacred space. So often what I find with, with story is, is it needs a special environment. And if there had been someone there, if there had been someone in that set and setting that wasn't able to be at the vibration of what was happening, it couldn't have happened. They'd disrupt it. So one last thing I'll say about the, about the funeral. Again, I think the more we tell stories, the, more we, the better we get at storytelling, right? And the more comfortable we get with an atmosphere that's more familial than formal. So when I had the mic and I was telling the, sto I was telling the stories of the cousins, because that's, that was my experience with my aunt is we were the, we were the, we were the next generation. We were the cousins. And I'd say something and I'd mention a cousin's name or I'd hear a cousin laugh and I'd mention their name. And I brought them into the experience together at risk of blowing the whole formality, but knowing that formality doesn't really exist, that formality is a barrier to intimacy. And what was said to me after was like, wow, we got to know the cousins. Like we got to know her nieces and her nephews and, and this generation that didn't speak at her service. And it was so needed. So I guess that's kind of where I'm at, you know? It's sort of where I'm at with, with, with grabbing the mic. There's often a sense, I think, within us that uh, a story needs to be told. And some, some of us who are more shy or afraid of being humble will, will retract instead of drop in. So that retraction is, is, a, is a contraction of self and you can use it to actually find your depth. It's not a bad thing, but use it to find profundity. Use it to orient towards depth and away from the surface. So that when you speak, you speak from depth. And that's where people need, it's, it's the medicine right now. Because we're in a culture that's dancing on the surface with too much on the mind and, 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 and too much that just doesn't mean anything. So the last thing I'll say, one of the things that, you know, my, that my elders are passing and, and bringing everyone together, we could really see how sick a lot of our elders are right now uh, and, and closer, closer to death than maybe we had thought. And most of the time it was great because we spent a lot of time together. We spent a lot of time, he, this guy cannot get enough of you all. Hey D. You want the mic? You hungry? Goofball. <laughs> he has a story that needs to be told. <laughs> so I got to sit with the 80 plus group quite a bit. Phenomenal storytellers, phenomenal joke tellers. And we really reflected on how this is being lost. This is not being carried on with the sort of like the, the, the sort of the Snapchat text generation. Like we've, we're really losing it. And we're losing it at the dinner table. We're losing it at our family gatherings. We're losing it in our friendship circles. So the work that you guys are doing together, bring it into your lives. Like bring it, bring it to where it's not happening. It's profound. And it's how humans have always conveyed significance is through story. Boom! Leave it to Kate. Come on now. Throw down. Throw down. Perfection. <laughs> Brilliant, provocative, inspiring. I didn't know some of those things. Mm. Kate is so committed to always evolving and stretching and growing. And that is so powerful. And I know we've run out of time with you and how you manage to craft it that way is a testament to many things about you and also to practice 500 podcasts, right? And yeah. allowing yourself that accumulation. I always talk about confidence being 
like building a coral reef of confidence each time you share a story, each time you post a story. So this was food for thought. I can see the ferns and now I'm gonna envision our beautiful group when we reconvene tomorrow as a community of ferns because you could see, and I love so many things about what you said, but how you're talking about the past is something that must be digested. Stories must be told as well as this hunger, deep hunger that we have for it and how it's important for us to bring it forth and keep that tradition going even in its new iteration, there's a deep hunger. Ooh, can't hear you. Whoa, 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 can't. Oh, you can't hear me? Can you guys hear me? Oh, wait a second. Did Kate say something? Because I can't hear Kate. That's weird. Ah, technology. Hold on. That's probably me. I think the cat, the cat, I'm like, <laughs> the cat. that was the thing we learned from the elders at this funeral was the power of practice. They, they, they told these same stories for decades. They told these same jokes and these aren't like the joke. They're not a punchline joke. It's a five minute joke. They told these jokes so many times and they're hilarious. You know, and they allow you to be in the process with them and to relax. They allow the listener to really relax and be drawn in. And boy, I learned so much. I learned so much from that. Yeah. Did you capture it, by the way? I'm just curious. Were you into documentarian mode? Did you record or anything? Oh, I wanted to. I, yeah, no, I wanted to. We have a bunch of them on, but not, you know, like the old men sitting around telling their jokes. That was the funniest, you know, and these jokes are so, and they were just on a roll and I couldn't, I couldn't disrupt it with it. I knew the mic would throw them off. So I, uh, yeah, but no, I, I hear, I hear you on that. All right. I got to go pick up my kid. Uh, great work, you guys in storytelling it. Like you're on to something. I promise. I promise the effort that you put in will continue to come back. Every time you're like, I wish I told it better. The best thing to do, and I'll leave you with this, is you wanna retrain your neural networks. Tell the story again, even if it's to yourself, but tell it in the way that's better and it'll be right there for you the next time. It's how you reprogram any habit and a story is like a habit. Boom. Hey, if you want, we'll put this on the podcast. Just send me the recording. Would love to. Boom and heart. <laughs> You're brilliant. Thank you for your generosity. We'll be chewing on this and digesting it for a long time and I will absolutely send it to you. Much love. Mwah.